Good morning to you all. It's such a beautiful day out today, and we welcome you to the house of the Lord. And we have a lot of seats. If people come in late, we can, we can seat them, can't we? <laughs> so, but I ask you to have a good, a good day today, because this is the day the Lord has made. A couple of announcements for your, we know if you have visitors, we welcome you. And in the hymn, uh, Racks, there's the, the yellow. If you have somebody that you would like to add us to prayer on our prayer concerns, we ask you to put that in the offering when that comes around. We certainly believe in the power of prayer. Um, there will be coins for Outreach International when uh, the children's ministry is finished. And then one more thing, um, we, we can join and celebrate Meredith's birthday right after church and it will just be out in the lobby, and uh, there'll be treats for us. And this week, Meredith had a happy 82nd birthday, didn't you, Meredith? Good, we're glad to see you here today. Okay, our theme this morning is demands of discipleship. And just as each of you are here and have um, made a pledge to follow Jesus, then you are a disciple. And God gave, um, or Jesus gave instructions to his, his disciples and apostles that followed him. And those are applicable for us today. Demands of discipleship can sometimes seem like a burden, but you always have to remember the joy, the fellowship, and the peace that we get with that, with that fellowship of, of being a disciple. And Elizabeth will now Call up, do our call to worship. As a spiritual venture, boldly follow the initiatives into heart of God's vision for the church and creation. Then, in response to growing insight about God's nature and will, continue to shape the communities that live. Christ's love and mission. Lovingly invite others to experience the good news of new life in community with Christ. Opportunities around, abound your daily lives if you choose to see them. Undertake compassionate and just actions to abolish poverty and end needless suffering. Pursue peace on and for the earth. Doctrine and Covenants 165, section 1b through d.
grateful for the invocation on the, on the screen. We witness to you, O God, that we are willing to take upon us the name of your Son. Lord, we are willing to proclaim Jesus. And always remember him and keep the commandments which he has given us. Lord, we remember and we are ready to follow. That we may always have his spirit be with us. Lord, we feel the spirit in your presence. Amen. Okay, kids, you want to come down with Josh? Hello? Hey, good morning, how are you? At Bible school I would say, uh, hey Bible schoolers, how do you feel? And then the Bible... Feel good. I feel <laughs> we feel good, oh we feel so good. <sighs> and it just, you know what, it's a lesson really every time we do it that uh, you kind of determine how you feel, don't you? I mean, bad things are going to happen to you, good things are going to happen to you, but it's how you think about those things that's going to determine whether you feel good or not. And so sometimes just saying it, we feel good, oh, we feel so good, makes you feel happy. Well, today on the bulletin I noticed that it says that our theme is the demands of discipleship. Hmm. The demands of discipleship. So if you want to be a follower of Jesus, there's certain things that you have to do. Okay? Certain things that you have to do. If you want to be a student at school, there are certain things that you have to do. First, you have to show up to where? School. You have to show up. And then you have to follow the rules and do your work and do your personal best. Do you guys know PBIS? You have to have active listening and all of those things, right? Well, to be a follower of Jesus, there are certain things that Jesus asks from us, asks us to do. And one of the ones that I think is really pretty tricky, Shay, really pretty hard to do is this one. It's in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus gave a really neat talk teaching people well, about what's good in life. And here from the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, it tells, Jesus tells us to love our enemies. Can I read a little bit of it? Now I want you to put your listening ears on and your thinking cap on. All right, everybody, go ahead. Put your listening ears on and your thinking cap on. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor. Have you ever heard, heard that before, love your neighbor? At Bible school we heard that. And hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who treat you poorly. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Hmm. So Jesus tells us not only to love our neighbors, but to love our anemones? No, those are fish, right? To love our neighbors, but also to love our... Enemies. To love our enemies. Hmm. <laughs> How many of you like to do that? Okay, well, lucky for me, I got to listen to a book called Enemy Pie this morning. Have you ever read that book before, Enemy Pie? And I was going to show it to the church, but it's 10 minutes, so I decided not to. But in the book, Enemy Pie, this kid, he has a lot of friends, and he has no enemies. And then a new kid moves into his neighborhood. And the new kid 
becomes friends with his best friend. And the new kid makes all kinds of friends and doesn't invite him over to his house to jump on the trampoline. And he feels left out and jealous. And so he says, now I have an enemy. And the little boy's dad says, well, you know, the best way to get rid of an enemy is to make him what? Enemy pie. Enemy pie. <laughs> yeah, good one, dad. <laughs> Let's make him an enemy pie. And so he goes out in the yard and he gets some earthworms and some bugs and his dad's, no, oh, no, that doesn't go in the enemy pie. And the dad starts making the enemy pie and the boy says, boy, that smells good, dad. Well, he's, dad says, well, of course it smells good. We have to make it smell good so he eats it. <laughs> anyway, the one condition though, before you give your enemy the enemy pie is you have to spend a whole day with them and be nice to them in order for the enemy pie to work. And so this boy goes over to his enemy's house. And he asks him, do you want to play? He says, sure, I'll play. And they play, and they have fun, and they do amazing things, and he realizes, we're not enemies, we're... Friends. Friends, because they spent time together. And he came over to his house, and his dad got out the pie. Oh, and it smelled so good. And he cut the pie into eight pieces, and he scooped all of them up some pie. And then the boy said, no, don't eat it. It's going to kill you. But then he looked over, and he said, then why is your dad eating four pieces? Not four pieces, but <laughs> most of the pie. And he said, oh. Oh. So they started eating the pie, and guess what? Guess what the enemy pie was? Regular, delicious pie. Regular, delicious pie. You see, Jesus was really a pretty wise guy. <laughs> Not a wise guy like, oh, you're such a wise guy. But he was somebody who really understood uh, the way that people can get along. And if you're mean to people, are you ever going to become their friend? No. But if you treat your enemy with love and respect, one day could you maybe become friends? Yeah. I've had it happen before. How many of you are friends with somebody that you didn't like before? How many of you out there? Look, get kids turn around. A lot of people, yeah, Nathaniel. So part of the demands of discipleship is that we not only love our neighbors and our families and our friends, but we love our enemies. And we pray for our enemies and we do nice things for our enemies. And that way we can really become the community of Christ. Christ. Okay, thank you for listening, everyone. We're going to collect the offering for Outreach International now. So if you kids would take a ba bag, and if you adults would reach deep into your pockets. Thank you.
God stretches out his hand to draw us steadfastly along the way. Even while we are still in the babyhood of faith, he is urging us toward that positive confession of his place in every area of our lives. When your heart gives a ringing positive yes to the word, positive results will begin to occur in your life. I know what I confess and I know what I possess. May God help us all to confess the positive things in Jesus' name. I confess Jesus as my Lord. Therefore, I possess salvation. I confess that with his stripes we are healed. I possess healing. I confess that the Son has made me free. I possess absolute freedom. I confess that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. I possess the ability to love everyone. I confess that he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I possess the presence of God each step of my way. I confess that I am the redeemed of the Lord. I possess redemption benefits every day. I confess that my God shall supply all of my needs. I will lack nothing since I possess God's abundant supply. I confess, I confess and, and possess. The way is clearly marked. I pray the word will do you good in Jesus' name. Did you all recognize the picture on the front of the bulletin? I think that has been used more times. <laughs> but talk about showing discipleship, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's one of my favorite pictures. Um, well, today for the uh, gen Disciples' Generous Response, I'm going to read you a, a story that really touched me. And it's 
a reflection on the cost of discipleship. Dietrich Bonhoeffner was a Lutheran pastor in Germany in the years leading up to World War II. He was on the staff of the seminary in the Confessing Church, a place for ordinands who were willing to defy the Nazi, Nazi regime. In 1935, the Gestapo turned their attention to this seminary and eventually closed it in 1937. That was the same year Bonhoeffner published his book, The Cost of Discipleship. Even though the seminary was closed, he continued to teach. In 1939, friends convinced Bonhoeffner to flee to America, but after a short period, he returned to Germany. He convinced, they had convinced Bonhoeffner, okay, but he, but, and he wrote after he returned. I made a mistake in coming to America. I must live through this difficult period of our national history with the Christian people of Germany. I will have no right to participate in the reconstruction of Christian life in Germany after the war if I do not share the trials of this time with my people. Bonhoeffner was arrested in April 1943 and, uh, was, and was imprisoned. At the concentration camp in Flossenburg, he was tried for treason, treason found guilty, and hanged. Now, this, you know, like Jesus, cost him his life. And, you know, that is very much, you know, I don't know how many of us would give our life in discipleship. We would all like to think we would, but it, you know, I would like to think I would, but it's, it's just very difficult to think that, you know, and he says in his book, you have to be able to give your all, and he, he showed us by example how to do it. Now, uh, will the deacons come forward? Uh, okay, as you share financially through mission ties, or if you give regularly through e-tithing, Please use this time to consider your commitment and how you will tithe to your true capacity of time, talent, and testimony. Will you bow with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you today hoping to, decent, to increase our discipleship for you as we go about our daily lives. Amen.
It is a pleasure to greet you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our theme today, of course, as, already, as you may already aware, is the demands of disciples. And I think that uh, even though uh, John McCain was not a member of this community of Christ, he was still a servant and a disciple for the things that he lived for and shared with us throughout his life. Last Sunday, Dave Loy shared with us a thought-provoking message that focused on the theme, Abide in Me. He encouraged us to abide in Jesus by remembering the commandments that Jesus gave us and make them a part of our daily lives. Hopefully, most of you remember elements of Dave's feature, uh, presentation and the amazing video showing us how a few people can become many by following Jesus to abide in, in allowing Jesus to abide in them. He encouraged us to accept Jesus into our lives so that we too can be a part of the many that enjoy his love and his blessings. I would like to make a connection between what Dave shared with us last Sunday and what I want to share with you today by reading selected verses from the book of John chapter 15 verses 1 through 13. I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in love. If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. I find the concept of Jesus abiding in me contained in this scriptural reference, it provides some additional insight into what Jesus is wanting us to know. You see, Jesus not only wants to abide in us and us in him, he wants us to be his disciples and assist him in sharing the message with others so that they may become disciples as well. Many of the early followers of Jesus who heard him telling them that he was the bread of life that came down from heaven, and how they needed to eat the bread and drink the wine that represented the flesh and blood, were confused and disturbed. Jesus realized this and responded with the following statement found in the book of John, chapter 6, verses 60 to 61. But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said unto them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to, to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. 
But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered him, Did I not choose you, the twelve? You, yet one of you, is a devil. He was speaking of Judas, son of his, Simon Iscariot, for he, though one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Why did so many people in Jesus' time turn away because of this conversation? Perhaps it was fear, fear of moving outside of their norm. Perhaps it was the literal meaning of Jesus' words that drove them away, or their failure to grasp the, next, the text as a deeper level. Perhaps some were beginning to understand that being a disciple of Jesus would not be a comfortable path. The sermon helps provided these words for our consideration. The Doctrine and Covenants, section 90, paragraph 5e, as adapted, states a long-held belief within the community of Christ that the elements are eternal and spirit and elements inseparably connected receive a fullness of joy. The enduring principle of sacredness of creation includes this description. Spirit and material, seen and unseen, are related. Like the early followers, we can be limited to an understanding of physical or worldly facets of Jesus' words. However, our life as disciples is not complete without grasping the depth of the spiritual spirituality involved. Merely eating bread does not guarantee eternal life. What is needed is a belief and faith in Jesus and the one who sent him. What were the characteristics of Peter and the other 11 that kept them on as the disciples' path when so many others turned away? Like Peter said, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. You see, discipleship is believing and responding when facing numerous obstacles. The story I am going to share with you in a moment helps us to understand a bit better why Peter and the disciples may have stayed on the disciples' path. I kind of identify with the author of this short story, which I believe may be help us in our discipleship. It's entitled the privilege to share by Martin Wiles Hodges of South Carolina, who starts his story with a scripture from the book of Ephesians, verse chapter 3, 7. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. And here's his story. At the time, I didn't see it as such but later I realized it was. I was born a PK, that's PK, that stands for preacher's kid. 
but became one shortly thereafter. By the time I was nine years of age, I was well indoctrinated. Things were different for me and my family than they were for normal people. We always lived near the church, and church folks popped in randomly. We lived under the microscope. Since I was the preacher's kid, I was expected to act differently than normal kids. No rebellion, no sassing my parents, or taking up bad habits that kids often experimented with. All of this seemed like a curse to me, but I later discovered it was a privilege to grow up in such a home. I was privileged to have Christian parents, Christian friends, and an expanded church family to make sure I remained on track. I didn't deserve it, it was a privilege. The Apostle Paul was raised religiously, but not, and, but legalistically. Freedom came after he met Christ and discovered life's real meaning. God gave him the privilege of serving him and spreading the good news to those who don't know it. As God's child, I possess the privilege of telling others about Christ. Though it, it's my responsibility also, it's not, it's not one of the drudgeries that I carry out. Being privileged to do something means I get to do something that not all people are allowed to do. Only believers can share because only believers have the special news to share. God will give me the opportunity to share. I simply have to be sensitive to his spirit's guidance along with the opportunities he gives courage, power, and ability. I share with confidence, not fear. Though sharing by whatever means I choose, God's love is communicated to others. Conversations that say, I care, and invite for supper needs kind, an invitation for supper, kind deeds, a thinking of you card, a random text, are all ways to spread God's love. What are you doing with the privilege God has given you? Make yourself available and watch what God does through you. See, I also was a preacher's kid. I was not born that way since my father was a Colorado wheat farmer. However, when I was about 10 years old, my father was ordained a priest in what is now called the Community of Christ. We did not live close to the church until about six years later when my father built a small church on the corner of our property in the small town where we lived after he turned the farm over to one of my older brothers. He was committed to sharing the gospel with others and worked diligently to bring, bringing others to the gospel. Unfortunately, I wasn't much help for him. I saw how he often was shunned by our neighbors and persecuted, so I know something about the demands of discipleship and its difficulties. And yet, over the years, I have come to realize how I have been blessed since I accepted the privilege of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. I can affirm, discipleship is believing and responding, even when facing numerous obstacles. I hope that maybe some of the things I've said this morning may assist each of you in your efforts to take up the demands of discipleship, not grudgingly, but willingly, to become faithful disciples in sharing the mission of Christ with others amongst yourselves so that, may bear, so that all may bear much fruit. In this way, it would please Jesus and show 
our love for God. May the Father and the Son bless you in your journey. Just my humble prayer. Amen. me together the congregational mission prayer that's in your bulletin together if you would God where will your spirit lead today help me be fully awake and ready to respond grant me courage to risk something new and become a blessing of your love and peace amen Apostle Paul said to the Philippians be afflicted for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When we pray, God listens. Pray with faith. Trust him and ask that his will be done. Your prayers always make a difference. We're adding Sandra Zeman for infection and surgery, Charlotte's and, and Jean's niece. B. Felter, Linda Johnson, Lori Kaplan, Mike Marlin, Jill Ruoff, Sarah Barnes, Kathy Vinton, Darren Felter, Lou Rapier, Carol Smith, Matt Smith, Nicole Burks, family of Leonard Boswell, and Betty Naylor. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come to you in faith, believing. 
we come to you with trust in your promises. We come to you remembering the many times that you have blessed us, that you have heard our prayers, that you have listened. We come remembering, Father, that you know what is best in every situation, and you will bring blessing according to your will and in your time and in your way. Grant us strength and faith in these things that your love does not fail. And even when we are anxious and we are afraid that you are there and you will always lead us through the hard times of our lives as well as the good times. Help us to be your disciples to risk something new, to not be afraid, to not be afraid to be different from those around us, or to speak of things that others don't speak of that are precious and spiritual and wonderful. Give us that courage and help us to stay very close to you and pray always and be renewed in you. You renew our spirits. You lift us up. You transform us. We thank you and pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Ascending forth, <clears throat> come to Christ and be perfected in him and deny all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, mind, and strength.